Hello and welcome. In this series of lessons, we're going to be looking at A-level system software, starting today by looking at some of the key parts of an operating system. So let's kind of start from the beginning. So I apologize if some of this is revision for you, but I always like to start at the most basic level. So let's remember, hardware is physical. It's tangible. It's what we can touch, whereas software consists of program codes and data files. So the computer itself, the CPU, the motherboard, the video card, all of that, that's hardware. The software, the instructions that allow the hardware to do something useful, like add up numbers in a spreadsheet, print a document, or display a web page, etc. There are two main types of software that we need to be aware of, system software and application software. So this is a kind of nice conceptual overview, just to show you kind of how we're breaking down software for this series of lessons. So we've got system software, application software, and then we're going to break system software down further into the operating system, utility software, and hardware drivers. So application software, this is the software that we want to use when we use a computer. It's software that allows the user to do something or make something. System software is really the software that runs the hardware. The interfaces between the hardware and software allows us to do the useful tasks that we want to do. So again, we're dividing this up into different categories. So we've got the operating system. This manages the hardware itself and manages all the programs running on the computer. Then we have device drivers, software that tells the operating system how it can communicate with peripheral devices. Finally, we have utilities. These are housekeeping and maintenance programs. I'll go through all of this in more detail in the next few videos. So key question, what is an operating system? Well, let's look a little bit at a historical context here. The first computers were programmed through wires and switches and would continue running a program until those wires and switches were set up differently. As computers developed, they were expected to run a number of programs, sometimes at the same time, cater for different users. Again, these are different users who could be using the computer system at the same time and interact with an increasingly large amount of different hardware. To do this, computers needed an operating system. An operating system is simply software that manages the computer. So over the years, the idea of operating systems has developed quite a lot. Modern operating systems have several purposes. To manage the hardware on the system, to manage all the programs installed and being run on that system, to manage the security of the computer, and to provide an interface between the user and the computer. So there are lots of very famous operating systems out there. I'm sure we're familiar with quite a lot of these. I'm sure we all know about Microsoft Windows. Android is Google's Linux-based operating system that uses on portable and mobile devices. iOS is Apple's operating system based on their version of Unix. So then take a little look, do a little research, make sure you can name and describe a few key operating systems. So let's do a kind of broad overview of an operating system. Again, operating systems are hugely complicated pieces of software. Modern operating systems are tens of millions of lines of code. They're very complicated, certainly the most complex piece of software that you'll be running on your computer system. So again, just a kind of conceptual overview here. We're going to take a look at operating systems from this point of view. So in the center, we've got the kernel. We've got user interfaces running on top of that. We've got device drivers allowing our operating system to communicate with hardware. And we've got various system utilities. So what is this kernel? Well, the kernel is the very core of an operating system. It has complete control over everything in the system. Sometimes the kernel will be referred to as the supervisor program. It's like the most important uh, part of the operating system. It is the first part of the oper say, operating system to load after the bootloader. So when you turn on your computer, 
It runs through all the settings, loads the operating system in through the bootloader, and then the kernel is loaded in. And the kernel is the part of the operating system that's always in memory, and it loads the rest of the operating system in and out of memory as required. But the kernel is always there, it's always in charge. The kernel does lots of different tasks, including managing system resources. So, for example, memory management, scheduling tasks to run efficiently in the CPU, file storage to and from secondary storage devices, controlling the peripherals through the device drivers, data security, and many other things. So a lot of these we will go through in a lot more detail in the next series of videos. So we'll look at memory management and scheduling, etc. So the kernel lies below the user interface. In an operating system like Windows, the user interface and the operating system as a whole are very much tied together. You can't really change the look and feel of Windows too much. But if you're using another operating system like Linux, the Linux part of the Linux operating system is technically only the kernel, the Linux kernel. There's a separate user interface that runs on top of this. So if you've got any experience with Linux, you'll know that you can change the user interface very easily, and that will completely change the look and the feel of the operating system. However, the kernel is still the same. So for example, we've got a couple of different versions of Ubuntu. We've got GNOME here. We've got KDE here. There are lots of other ones. And that will completely change how the, the look and feel of the operating system is. But it's still the same operating system because it's still the kernel underneath. One of the key features an operating system has to provide is a user interface. This allows the user to interface with the computer. It's how the computer gives information to the user, how the user gives information to the computer. There are traditionally three main types of user interface. We've got the command line interface, where the user interacts by typing commands into the computer. We have a graphical user interface, or GUI. This uses the windows, icons, menus, and pointers in a user-friendly, visually attractive manner. And we've got a menu-based system, where users only have a limited range of options. So, for example, the ATM at your bank or an automated check-in kiosk at an airport would be menu-based. So again, here are some examples. So hopefully from your GCSE studies or earlier studies, you'll kind of know the advantages and disadvantages of these. If I just do you, give you a brief rundown, we start with the command line interface. So a command line interface is great if you are a programmer, if you're a network administrator, because you can type in those commands and you've got very simple, powerful commands that allow you to get to a lot done in a very short amount of time. But command line interfaces are not good for people who are not computer experts. They're not intuitive. You have to learn perhaps dozens or hundreds of commands before you can make it useful. If you make a mistake, it's very difficult to see what went wrong and how to fix it. Graphical user interface, the type of computer interface that we're all used to using. Most desktops and laptops run it. Uh, handheld devices, portable devices use graphical user interfaces. They're easy to learn. They are intuitive. They can be attractive. It's easy to experiment and find out how to do things. But graphical user interfaces can be a bit more slow and cumbersome if, for example, you're a network administrator. And also they require more system resources to run than a command line interface. The menu-based system is very good when you're going to have non-computer experts using a system. It's going to be very user-friendly. There's only a limited range of options. There's not much that can go wrong. You press the right button. It goes to the next screen. You have the next set of options, etc., etc. So you might have found this in one of the older kind of Nokia brick phones. Again, you'll find a lot of public information kiosks. There's not much you can do with them. They're not very flexible. But if you're going to have people who are not good with computers, Using it in a public environment, menu-based might be the way to go. You've also got a more modern system of interfacing with the computer, the natural language or voice recognition system. So these are designed to be like we are talking to the computer. 
we're asking questions with a limited scope for variation in answers. So again, we've probably got a lot of familiar familiarity with this in recent years. We've got things like Apple's Siri, Amazon's Alexa, uh, Microsoft Cortana, Google Assistant. They've made great strides in the last four or five years, but there's still problems using them. Uh, different languages, different accents. It doesn't always catch what you want. It gives you the wrong response. But some people really like using them. And again, they have developed a lot in the last few years. Okay, I'll draw this first video to a close. I will see you in the next video, and we'll go into operating systems in increasingly a large amount of detail. Good luck.